No. The Smoking Poetry Podcast is going on, and it is expanding more than I even imagined. And that, frankly, is because of Lauren, who said, we need to go beyond the spoken word. And today, we're going to talk about some other art, some amazing paintings, and behind every amazing art is an amazing artist. Today, we have Matt Atkinson. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, thank you. So we basically found you kind of by an accident, kind of on purpose. We were looking at the, uh, what was the place, Lauren, we were at? The, the art, uh, you can talk to me. Studio 113. What Ga was that? Yeah, Gallery 113. Gallery 113. And, and Lauren said, look at this. And I looked at it and I said, wow. And Lauren made friends while I was looking at your painting. Um, so we're going to talk about some art and some other things that you do. But why don't you tell people a little bit about who are you? Who is Matt Atkinson? And tell us about what you, what your love is. Okay. Um, I've been a full-time artist for about 10 years. It'll be 10 years in November. And that was when I first made an attempt to do serious art. When I started doing it, I was absolutely terrible. Um, it was just awful. But I enjoyed trying it. And one of the reasons why I gave it a try is that my mom had given me one of those all-in-one, like, really cheap kind of art kits, you know. And none of it's really very good, but I was so honored that she'd given it to me. And I wanted to give it a try, you know, out of appreciation for what, what she'd done. And I just really liked it. So how old were you, old were you when this happened? Uh, I would have been right at about 40, 41. 41? Mm -hmm. So... So I'm 51 now. So, so when, uh, so uh, the 40-year-old Matt Atkinson, were you doing any kind of art? Not, not so much art. Um, I had worked in the, in a clinical mental health field, and I'd been a, a writer before that, but not really so much art. Which is funny because I do have an art degree, which I'd never used. I got it, went straight into social work as a career and just returned to art about 10 years ago as a way of just like personally satisfying um, my creative need and never imagined that it would turn into a vocation. And you know, this is part of my inspiration here. It, should we pause? Sorry. We're back after the food came in and we were talking about the inspiration because uh, what we have in common is we both have kind of gone in the art world mm -hmm. a little bit later than most people do, but mm -hmm. you got me beat by about, I think, six years or so. Mm. Um, so well, let's talk about that. So, I mean, yeah, your mom brought you some stuff, but how did that go from trying it out to some of the things we're about to look at? I think that um, I just, I didn't give up. So some art role models of mine had said, if you want to make it, you have to paint about a thousand miles of canvas. And the first thousand miles of canvas is just practice. So I stayed with it. And one of the best things that I ever did to help myself along is to buy a membership to a nearby art museum. Mm -hmm. And I would go there almost every week and just study paintings of my own art role models, not to imitate them, but to learn how they solved problems in their work, um, how they com composed complex things, um, how they would create color harmony. And so I learned a lot of that by studying those role models. So was there, is there like a type, I you think you described it as Gothic Western, or do I have the, yeah, well, what would you describe yourself as as far as your area? I'm a Western artist with a heart of goth. Okay. So I grew up, um, you know, in the goth, alternative, punk um, counterculture, mm -hmm. uh, especially in its golden age through the 80s, and never left it behind. It, it, you know, gave me something good in life that I've carried with me. Was there any kind of like difference in the stuff you painted originally versus what you paint now over the 10 years, or has it kind of been the same type of stuff? It's always been Western art. Uh, I've expanded since then, but I haven't, like, moved away from any of the subject matter. Um, I've always kind of focused on scenes of American history, uh, Western landscapes, wildlife, those kind of things. But since then, I've started to kind of add in my kind of expressive, creative, 
gothic type side, maybe with a series that I've done of raven drawings and paintings. And any examples? Maybe we should show something off that I'm sure. really staring around, and I'll let you pick what to show. Yeah, here, we'll start with this one. Okay. I'm going to just kind of <laughs> give you some room here. What? So what are we uh, looking at? All right, so what we're looking at is a printed background of vintage paper superimposed with um, an anatomical drawing from a medical textbook. And then this, these are oil painted. Those are my original hand painted oils. And um, I spotted this typewriter at a vintage market here in town and had to have it. So I bought the typewriter just because it looked so cool. The textures, the age of it, the patina. And then I, I positioned these two on it just because I thought that it would really kind of go well. It's not making a statement. It's more just about the... Um, the visual complement of the the rustic kind of detail of this and then the sleek movement of the birds and the sleek um, values and shading that they have and I just kind of like that contrast between them but it all kind of comes together in something that's um, it's got some strangeness to the image that I like yeah, one thing that I notice about all of the all of the work and we're gonna see some more stuff it almost well, it does. It looks like it's 3D. It looks, I, at first when I saw it, I went, is this a painting or a carving? How do you do that where it looks like that? So the, the biggest way to do that is by having contrasting values. Um, so value would be light and dark areas. So like I might have this, this bright highlight coming in against this line here, or the dark shadow coming in against this line, or having the, the highlights on the typewriter mechanics and then the darkness of the tail feathers. So each time that you set a layer of dark versus light and you break lines of dark and light like that, it adds dimension. You'll see that in landscape paintings too as mountains become softer and bluer the further back they go and that gives you atmospheric depth and that's just kind of what I've got here except I'm using um, light and dark and blur and detail to create that effect. What kind of materials do you, I mean, you've mentioned some of it, but is it like, what kind of paint do you use? So these are all oil paint. I don't have one particular brand I'm loyal to. Uh, so I have an eclectic combination of oil paints at home. But what I did was I kind of sketched out where this would go. I added gesso to the paper. Gesso is like an, an underpainting, like a, a layer that oil paint adheres to well. And then painted this in oil right onto the paper. That way the paper won't soak up the oil or it'll stay archival. Um, it'll stay vibrant and bright like this. It won't fade. And that's what I did it, then is just paint with oil directly on the on the paper. Yeah, um, and should we swap around some sure. stuff and show as it's that people look at some of the other uh, work we're doing here. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this one. Yeah, that one's small enough where I can still sit down. Yeah. So I call this one Raven Romance. And um, I just like the idea of these symmetrical ravens working together to create the impression almost of like a heart or a Valentine image. And this one I started to explore um, combinations of materials. So it's on like a deckled edge, like torn paper. And then that is fastened to um, embroidered fabric behind it. And then over the top is some vintage lace that I found, uh, just bought a little sample of it from Etsy and thought that made kind of a nice piece to it also. So that's kind of how I put this one together. And this is, this is pencil, unlike the other one that's oil painting. This is a pencil drawing. Really? Yeah. That's a pencil. Yeah. So I would not have guessed that. It's graphite and then a little bit of white chalk for the highlights. Wow. What, what is the, uh, the red and the greens? Those would be done mostly like with watercolor tinting. Wow. So when you, a, a lot of what you have, we're going to show some more of them, are um, crows. Mm -hmm. Why crows? I do a lot of crows and ravens or any, any kind of corvid. Uh, I like them because they're considered to be really intelligent, really clever. They're very social. Um, I've actually befriended some ravens. There were some people here in town who 
were experts at raising them who had taken care of two that wouldn't have been able to live independently. And so I got to meet and encounter their ravens and, and even you know, carry some of them on my shoulders at times. And, and um, just kind of getting to know their personality has been really enjoyable for me. Really? What, what about their personality uh, compared to other, well, there, other animals or birds? <laughs> that um, there. they're, they're very clever. They can understand language. They can... What do you mean they understand language? They can understand the words that we use in a conversation. Like a dog understanding, like a command, or you, or you think? Um, with an even more advanced vocabulary than a dog. Okay. Um, more along the lines of a chimpanzee in intelligence. Really? Mm-hmm. And so they're able to solve puzzles and develop tools. They're also able to um, kind of ascertain what they believe that you know. So they know how to lie. They can trick you. Um, they, they understand deception. They also understand how to pass information to one another mm -hmm. about which humans have been um, kind to them. So they're able to give each other um, sort of a judgment about whether you're a good or a bad person so that the others will know how to interact with you. So I kind of like all those attributes of them. Uh, I like their position in folklore, um, myths and legends, um, Obviously, the writings of Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I guess that counts as poetry for the show here, right? Why not? Yeah. yeah. So, so their their place in literature and and world folklore, I think, is kind of significant. I, I enjoy that too. Interesting. Um, do you need any arm breaks? I'm good. You're good. We're just gonna keep going. I, you know, okay. I want to keep this going here because. I wish the can. I always say best things are off camera, and I think the best thing I. Lauren just did this little look at me, and I, when I was like, "Really?" And she's, I wish we had that on camera. What, my look? Your look, uh, yeah, that you're oh. looking at me, yeah, I'm like, really, okay. Yeah, he's right. All right. He is right. I have Thank not studied you. that before, but I will not argue with the nod there for sure. So, you have is it some other things, uh, sure. different kinds of things you also like to paint? Um, yeah. Do you want to see more of the the Raven art, or do you want to see? Because I have a couple more. Why don't yeah? You know, why don't we finish the Raven subject and yeah. then we'll break to another subject? Yeah. Could you could yeah. you bring one of those over? Okay. So this one was done in pen and ink. So this is all um, you know, just drawn in with pen on vintage paper, and then I added the um, the color highlights with watercolor, because if you've ever seen ravens in sunlight, their feathers become iridescent. They're not just Black people think of them as a black bird, but they're very iridescent and you can see purples and turquoises and cyans all reflecting in their their feathers And that's kind of what I wanted to capture in this plus I wanted to sort of Represent if I if I could I wanted to represent their intelligence in in the uh, the eye that has life in it and sparkle in it So there's a little bit of mischief going on um, and why don't we go on to, I see, this one's kind of a, an extra cool one because it's got the Ravens plus a little something. Oh, plus a little something. Oh, plus a little something. Yeah. Let's talk about what this we got. one of my favorites. So this is also a, a pencil drawing in chalk. And like the other one, this is done on a printed vintage paper with anatomical textbook drawings on it. Um, the title of this one is called Merciful Release. And it's, it's kind of playing off the idea of um, like mortality, life, um, being fulfilled, that even knowing that our lives have limits can, in a sense, be a blessing uh, because it gives us a sense of immediacy and a sense of almost like provocation to try things, to be curious. So I kind of like that idea. Um, like the memento mori concept in literature. What does that mean? It means to remember that we all have an appointed time to die. And depending on your outlook, people can see that as very grim, and I don't. I, I see it as provocative, but in a good way. I see it as uh, life-affirming, in fact. So it's, it's not, to me, like a, a grim or despairing maxim. It's... it's it's more about an affirmation of life. 
So that's kind of why I wanted them. Again, you notice again the pair of ravens, and again playing off the values of like the light back here against the dark of the feathers, and the dark of the ravens against the light of the skull. Um, you know, trying to create that dimensional effect, and then having like the uh, the vintage anatomical drawings in the in the background too. So this is kind of a nice representation of more like my goth side. What is that in the background? Like, like the what does that represent? Or? Let's see. So on here we have a diagram of the human brain, and then here we have a diagram from Gray's textbook Anatomy of of the head and the different sections of the head as determined by where cranial nerves connect. And this, is, this has become almost a famous emblematic drawing, too. Um, so I thought having this icon of, of like vintage anatomical information in the picture could be... Hmm? There's so many different layers in that one. Oh, what yeah. really stands out. Um, like when you're painting something like that, are you going like left to right or like subject to one thing to another? Like how do you do, do that? Um, for something like this, I actually started with, with the skull first because I don't draw a lot of these or paint a lot of these. So I knew that this is what I had to get right. If, if I couldn't get this, none of the drawing would work. So I started with this just to know if it would be successful before I continued. The ravens are my like the most fun thing for me to draw. I love drawing and painting them. So I saved this almost like dessert. Um, you know, I wanted to really play with the textures, the you know, the roughness of the the, the feathers and um, you know all of the uh, the different overlapping patterns in, in the birds. So I kind of liked again playing with the contrast between all these kind of rough raggedy details against the smoothness you know up here wow um well i was going to ask you what aside from this painting just some general painting things i just thought of yeah, right? yeah. so when i imagine it's different for different painters or, but when you like do you work on multiple things at once or do you have one you're going to do start to finish get that done before you move on to the next i do multiple things at once but i don't mean to <laughs> I'm, I'm just i get hyperactive yeah <laughs> so sometimes what i'll do is i'll set one aside and i'll begin another painting and then i'll come back to the one that i've set aside and do some like mistake corrections and things like that mm -hmm. stuff that i notice i would imagine um it can vary from painting to painting but like how would you describe like the how long it takes like from the time you start your drawing or painting to the time that's ready for showing off how long would you say like the ranges i mean obviously there's got to be a great range i would think yeah but what kind of ranges would you start to say so most of the ones that i've been showing you so far would be about a week um i do this full time so i can set my own hours and you know i go to work in my studio or if it's a drawing i can sit with it in my lap while my sons and i are watching tv or movies together and i can work on it mm -hmm. um, but i might put in about a week of time on something this size the longest i've ever spent on one was i think it was two months on a, on a really large drawing um, so I, that was kind of a time investment and i do some large paintings that might take three to four weeks to finish. Okay. Well, I want, so Yana here, uh, my, uh, my legal assistant for the other job, had a great question. Mm -hmm. And well, I'm going to ask you that. How do you buy this stuff and how, and what's the kind of price ranges? Right now I'm represented here locally by Gallery 113 in downtown Colorado Springs. It's on Tejon. Mm -hmm. So I do have a section uh, in that gallery that just shows my work um mostly my oil paintings and those are like in the 200 dollar, maybe up to 800 dollar price range um generally artwork will cost pretty much the same for anything that's in a comparable size range mm -hmm. uh, art tends to be priced by size more than anything so you would calculate the square inches and and figure out what the price would be for that i do have some variations from that though if there's art, for example, where I've had to hire models, then that art might cost a little bit more because I'm I've got an expense in it to, to you know to cover. And sometimes with wildlife art, 
I've traveled to other estates and done like private wildlife photo shoots and things that might be kind of an investment that, that figures into the price. So can people buy from you directly or you have like a contract where you, they have, you go through the... They can buy from me directly, um, but I, have to, I do match the gallery price. Like they can't undercut the gallery by saying, hey, could you make me a deal if I buy it from you instead of the gallery? Um, well, we're definitely going to put in all the the link description okay. and we'll do the thing down here. But, uh, but why don't you tell people uh, how do they find you and how do they buy your stuff? So you can go to um, my website, mattatkinsonart.com. That's Matt with two T's. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram, also at Matt Atkinson Art, and Facebook, Matt Atkinson Art. So those are the, the best ways to see the work that I'm doing, see my portfolio, uh, interact with me. Um, and what about the gallery other than going, can they find that online also or do they have to go in person there? Uh, going in person is best because all the artists in that gallery will frequently refresh our inventory. Uh, gallery 113 does have a website if you, if you Google Gallery 113 in Colorado Springs. In other words, you don't remember the exact website. Not exactly. <laughs> it's hard to remember all those details, yeah. but easy enough to find. Yeah. And uh, where is it located? Um, do you, it's on Tejon or? Yeah, 125 okay. Tejon. Okay, well, that's the important thing. We got that down. Yeah. Um, why don't we talk about the other types of paint besides the Ravens? And oh, I think okay. you have, I don't know how many examples you brought for the. Got one other example here? I, I brought one other example, just something different from the Raven series I've done. Oh, I'll show okay. you some of the Western work that I do. Yeah, I brought this one because I like to tell stories about it. And like they real, they look so realistic. Well, thank you. Um, it's like I would. I, I'll just let you describe what is it. And so what? And how do you do it? All right, this is one of my oil paintings. I paint oil on panel rather than just stretching a canvas. That way it's more archival. Um, it won't warp or tear or puncture or anything like that. So I kind of like doing it that way. It, it'll last longer, it's more durable. But this is all done in oil paint. And I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story about this scene itself. So these are three Crow Indian young women that I worked with as models uh, from Crow Agency area of Montana. And this past summer, I drove up and had some um, an opportunity for some private photo shoots with members of the Crow tribe there. And these were the, the daughters of some of the, um, the adults that modeled for me. And I just was able to capture this moment without anything being posed, none of it being staged. Um, you know, they were dressed up traditionally, but, and, and that made them just delighted. They just felt so happy being dressed like that and, and seeing each other and knowing how they looked, that you could just see their demeanor light up. So what we did is I just, I went inside the teepee with them. This is um, a Crow Lodge. Went inside the teepee and just let them interact like normal. Uh, I might give them a little bit of advice, like, hey, could you scoot closer? That kind of thing. But I didn't, um, I didn't prescribe any particular compositions or, or actions on their part. I just wanted to capture them as they really were. And what I noticed is that, that these girls had this amazing sense of wonder and curiosity and delight about the world, um, a playfulness between each other that I liked. And it just, it just gave me a sense of happiness that, that these girls could share um, those positive experiences with the world around them, that it would make them that happy that they would want to to make those feelings a part of their friendship so that's what i was trying to capture in here you know the the delight that's on her face and and, and the smiling um do they have to hold the pose no i i just took rapid fire photos as as they would just be themselves Oh, so when you're painting, you're, you're, you're kind of looking at the photographs, yeah, not yeah. directly looking at right, them right, at the right. time. I shoot my own reference photos. So if I do a painting from a photo reference, it's my imagery. Um, so it's still my own original uh, references. But I do that so I can make sure to get accuracy later. Like I want to make sure that the beadwork on their dress is correct. 
um, that the uh, the women's style of earrings she's wearing, that's going to be correct. This is all going to re be representative of a particular tribe and a particular era. It's not going to be mixed and match fantasy costume <laughs> um, new age stuff. It's This is going to be historically accurate. If someone from 1870s Crow Nation saw this, they would recognize every single thing in it. They, that would, this would all be normal to what they're experienced with in their lives. Wow. Um, what caused your interest in the Crow tribe in particular? Well, I, I work with a lot of Crow models um, because the families that I work with there are experienced in modeling with a lot of artists. So they know what they're doing. They uh, they're they're eager to do it. They're enthusiastic about what they do. They're knowledgeable. Um, they have a really classic traditional look about them as well. So it's it's a um, it's just a process that works naturally whenever I work with these families. I also like the fact that when I when I'm able to sell paintings with their images in them, I know that I've also helped them support their families by paying those models they are able to support their families too. So buying a painting like this, you are also supporting um, families that are living traditionally on, on Crow Reservation. So that's something that I kind of like about it too. It, it, it feels like I'm approaching this in the right way. I'm approaching this in a way that members of the tribe, um, they respect the work that we artists do after they model for us. Um, so they see it as an appropriate representation of their lives. Do they get a copy of what you do? Sometimes. Um, if, there, if there's a really special piece, and like maybe this one that, that has their daughters or their nieces in it, they might specifically say, that one's kind of special. Do you think I could get a print of that? And whenever they do ask for that, um, you know, we make sure that they get that. They don't have to buy anything from us like that at all. We make sure that we do that as... Um, as a gesture of our appreciation, as a, as a sign of respect. And that's one of the reasons why the families have been willing to work with me year after year, is because they, they know that when they provide these images for me, that I will portray them respectfully. I will portray them accurately. Wow. But do you do multiple, multiple numbers of a print? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I will. Okay. Yeah. That's um, another great question. How yeah. Many, like if, if when you painted that, for example, how many, how many of those are out there in the world? This one, none yet. I make prints after the original sells. So uh, that's the original. This is the original painting, and once the original sells, I don't really do limited editions. Um, some artists do. I do open editions. So what does that mean? That means that that it will continuously be available. I can I can replenish the inventory if I need to. It also helps keep the price lower for people who want to buy them. Not everyone can buy a fifteen hundred dollar or two thousand dollar painting, but maybe they can buy one of my twenty dollar prints or a fifty dollar print. That's another great question. If someone appreciate your stuff, but you know, not everyone can spend two hundred bucks, mm -hmm. uh, what other options are there? Um, I would say getting getting the prints made. I have a bin of prints available at the gallery that people can look through or they can contact me through the website about the pieces that they've seen and ask if it's available yet. If the original has sold, then any piece in my inventory can be uh, reproduced as a, as a high quality print. So I have everything photographed in like a really high resolution way um, where I use like tungsten lighting and polarizing filters and everything to get like perfect down to the brush stroke detail. And so I, I'm able to print on paper or canvas. What would a print of something like that be? What would be like a rough uh, kind of range of price? You might get from... So at the gallery, most of the prints I, I sell are, are eight by tens, and I sell those for $20. Something full-sized, if it was on paper, it, then it might be about $50. If it was on canvas, maybe it would be about 75 Wow. Do you do a lot of indigenous I do. Uh, I, re I, I do paintings that portray um, Crow, Cheyenne and Arapaho, uh, different bands of the Sioux Nation, Blackfeet, and occasionally Ute and some Navajo or Diné people. Um, so a lot of the people who are in like the um, Upper Missouri or Great, uh, the Plateau, Great Plains area. 
any particular reason, any kind of family background or, or interest that got you into that? Not because of family background, but more because of the area where we live, that this is an area where Plains Indians and Mountain Indians like the Ute and the Cheyenne and the Sioux would, would have all, um, you know, had interaction with each other here, both friendly and not. And so a lot of the regional history of indigenous people um, has kind of put my attention more toward those nations. Um, well, I actually have some other, I'm going to move that one to the side. Actually, Good to keep going for a few more, or you want to break? We can take a quick break. All right, we'll break. What's okay. your name? I'm Lex. Lex, and we are here at Third Space. Third and Space tell us, what have we got? Tell, why don't we also market this a little bit? What do you have for people who need a little space to do podcasts or whatever? Oh, yeah. Maybe? Third Space is awesome. I mean, it's a little tucked away. It's kind of a hidden gem, but over COVID, because we have that garage door open, we could yeah. advertise like open air seating. So people kind of found us. Um, but I mean, I did homework here for like a really long time before I got a job here. But yeah, you can always rent the venue out. Um, this meeting room gets rented out pretty frequently. It's essentially free because what happens is you pay for a $50 deposit. And then if you whatever money you spend within that you get back, like food or drink credit. So at the end of the day, like you had said, you'd pay Fifty dollars already, so you would just get that money back. Oh, okay. But yeah, if you ever want a cup of coffee or a super stupid dad pun joke, um, you can come see me at the bar. And where where are we? And how do they people look up the place on the We are in. Uh, we're off um, Vickers and Academy, uh, right by Taco Bell and Arby's. Um, but yeah, if you guys wanna come head on over and come see me, I pretty much live here. So. Well, thanks for making this even an extra special <laughs> episode. I'm Mike. Mike. And this Hi. is Matt. I'm Matt. Great hair, Matt. Thank you. And that's Lauren Hi, with the, Lauren. the faces Hi. behind the camera. What do you guys like do on your podcast normally? Oh, this one's about um, some of the art that I've done. Oh, you done? You, that's yours? Yeah. So, so these are some of like my paintings. No and, and way. Things. That's sick. Oh, thanks. If you're interested at all, too, in, like, getting your art out there, we have a bunch of local artists that we put up on the walls and sell their art. I mean, I just sold, like, three the other day. So awesome. um, if you want to get in contact with the owner and kind of handles all that consignment stuff, you're more than welcome. Because that's actually be really cool. good. You know? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We'll come find you later so you <laughs> yeah. can see everything you're you telling people online. You guys enjoy online. the rest of your, your, rest of your <laughs> So should we just keep going? Let's just keep going because I did want to, as much fun as that was, um, I want to ask, because there's, there's some stuff that maybe people who are into art, it's maybe not so much fun, um, but people probably need to know about. And um, one of those is mistakes. But we were talking about mistakes sometimes people make and mm -hmm. the learning process. What can you tell people about that? In the learning process itself? Well, and, and uh both the learning and everything you're doing from start to now that oh. can go wrong with something that you need to, that made people be good to hear about before the mistake when possible. Okay, well, let me start by talking about mistakes in the business side of it. And that would be things like um, trying to work with the gallery without clarifying things in a contract first, like um, the commission the gallery takes. Or if the gallery wants to return art to you, who pays for that expense? Uh, where will your art be displayed? Will it be displayed or are they going to put it in storage? That kind of thing. Um, whether or not their inventory is insured. So those would be some of the things that you would want to consider if you were going to start working with galleries. Now, um, how does can you make a living doing this? Is it very difficult to do that? It's difficult. Uh, I've been fortunate. Some months are really good, and sometimes it's pretty tough. During COVID, it was tough because a lot of galleries shut their doors, and a lot of the art shows that I depend on didn't happen. So I did have a tough year and a half, a couple years because of that. Uh, in general, though, I, I, I'm not one of the uh, big-name, high-status, wealthiest painters out there. But at least I can support my my sons and our house, things like that. Um, now, there's some um, other stuff that you about you besides the uh, painting that we had talked about before the show, which is I think 
very important, and mm-hmm. that's about your writing oh, and yeah. uh, and some of the therapy type of stuff. Well, why don't you tell people, what kind of writing have you been doing? From the, the time in my life when I worked in the clinical mental health field, I wrote a textbook on the, um, like the clinical treatment of PTSD that arises from sexual trauma. So I worked with a lot of trauma survivors who, were experience, who had experienced sexual assault. And so I, I created a textbook that goes step by step through the recovery process, um, like how you write your journals, how you process your story, how, uh, how you interact with a therapist. And I wrote it using examples from actual clients who had given consent for their, their work to be shared in print so that you can see other survivors who have um, written their journals and gone step by step through their experiences. And so you kind of have other survivors as your guides and role models. I did another book called Letters to Survivors, and it is, it's actually letters written from women from around the world who are survivors of trauma. And it's, they're sharing their wisdom and their advice and things that they wish that they had known so that those who are new to recovery, the, the, the newly wounded, will have mentors and role models um, who are sharing things with them. And in the book Letters to Survivors, I reproduce the actual handwritten letters so you can see where people have like, scribbled things out and tried to you know, reconsider how to say things. And you, you can see the personal uh, writing that someone has, has put into that. My third book, of three, is I wrote a book about using the lessons and the parables from the Harry Potter series as a guide to recovering from trauma. And it's called Expecto Patronum, uh, using the lessons from Harry Potter to recover from trauma. And I, I go through some of the experiences that Harry and his friends have had and explain why these aren't just children's stories, they're actually wisdom parables. And they show us how we can become resilient and how we can draw on inner strength and how we can overcome feelings of loneliness and shame as a result of trauma. Um, That was one of the most fun books to write, I think. Wow. Uh, Where can people find these books? Um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. um, Any bookstore can order them. So these are actual, like, Books with paper, they still yeah. exist nowadays? They're physical books, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Can can they also be found online, or are they pretty much limited to the uh, actual physical paper books? I don't have e-books, if that's what you're asking. Right, that's the word, e-books. Yeah, they, like... um, but like I said, they, bookstores can stock them, Amazon can get them for you. Oh, I, I find that's part of my motivation. I was not the same type of, of abuse survivor, but I'm a different kind of abuse survivor. Mm-hmm. And those, some of those feelings very much yeah. um, I can very much relate to, and I appreciate you talking about that. Any other, and to the extent you would like, what else would you like to talk about on, on that? Well, um, I'm able now to, to be open enough that I'm a survivor. Um, I experienced some childhood trauma like that, and also some adult experiences. Uh, and I'm really proud of the work that I've done. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long process, but it's been so worth it too. It's one of the hardest things I've done and probably one of the best things I've done. Because I wanted to make sure I was a good dad to my sons. I wanted to make sure that they grew up with a, a dad who um, was healthy, uh, thoroughly nonviolent in action and words and you know, that our home is happy, that their people don't experience conflict or stress there. Uh, people can relax and feel comfortable with who they are and how they express themselves in my home. And it, those are some of the accomplishments I'm most proud of, is the fact that my boys mm-hmm. have been able to grow up in that kind of a positive environment. Have you found um, yourself to make kind of progress like significant progress more recently in life versus maybe in your 20s or, yes. or younger? Because I've noticed with me, I've made leaps more recently that did not, ex- and not a whole lot of progress earlier in life. And so like for the uh, the older guys my age, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what would you say to, say to them about making progress on dealing with these things? And- what I found is that 
if you're not ready to deal with some of this stuff, nothing that you try to do will make yourself get ready. But if this, if you are ready to deal with it, nothing you can do will stuff it back down. Yeah, you have to make you have to make the first step. You have to you have to make those steps. Yeah. Um, and never too late. Sir. Is and never too late. I'm 51, and you know I I recognize my faults and my flaws, but I like the man that I am. Um, I don't think I'm awesome or special, but I feel like. I bring good qualities into the relationships and connections I have with people around me. Well, we think you're awesome and special. <laughs> and, and that makes me shy and, when people do say that. <laughs> and um, and I was thinking that might be like the perfect way to kind of wrap things up. Were there? Did we catch the big subjects we wanted to talk about here? Or was I there think something we did. I, I want to know about Grandma's pen. Grandma's pen. What's Grandma's pen? Oh, I know. I know what she's referring to. Um. My grandma, uh, my family um, came from Canada. My, my grandmother lived in a really tiny little small farm town and the, the little senior center that they had in town would have painting classes. And so my grandmother loved oil painting. And she would go in with the other seniors and do paintings of birds and flowers and nature and things like that. When she died, I inherited a lot of her art supplies and some of the brushes that I inherited still had paint on them, which I thought was pretty special, irreplaceable. And the paints that she had, they weren't usable anymore, but the brushes, even though they're, they're not great brushes, I've kept all of them. And whenever I'm working on an oil painting, I use really nice, like sable, expensive brushes. But at some point when I'm finishing, I will take one of the brushes that she left behind and I will add just a brush stroke here or there with my grandmother's paintbrush. Um, some people are aware of that. I've written the story on my website, but it's not something that I like, actively promote about it because it is just kind of a special symbolism to me. It represents that I'm taking care of that heritage, that the, uh, the things that my grandmother passed down and things that were important to her in her life are things that I'm trying to preserve. Um, Preserving stories is one of the important things in my art. And that's one of the physical ways that I can incorporate that symbolism into the paintings that I do. Wow. What other questions we got before we close this out for the day? All right, we're all good then. Well, this was wonderful. And I think we are definitely going to have more artists uh, because this, I think, went very well. Thank you, Lauren, for the idea. And thank you, thank Matt, you. for coming on. I had a and, blast. And uh, thank you to all of you who are who are watching, both of you. But no, hopefully many, many more of you. <laughs> and uh, send us those uh, likes and subscriptions and shares and comments. And if there's something you did not like, that's fine, too. <laughs> and more importantly, if there's something you would like to see in the future, send me a comment about it. So see you next time on Smoking Poetry Podcast.